make sure my um, Okay, I'll go ahead and get started as people are starting to log in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. Um, I am so excited to have Dr. Kabele here with us. Um, so my name is Hima, and I'm one of the medicine current internal medicine chief residents. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kabele, this morning. Dr. Kabele currently serves as the chair of the Department of Obstetric obstetrics and gynecology here at Washington University in St. Louis and is the Mitchell and Elena now a professor, a professor um, in the division of uh, obstetrics and gynecology. Prior to coming to WashU, Dr. Cabele uh, served as the director um, of the division of gynecologic oncology and vice chair for research in the department of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Kansas. Her research has focused on the pathobiology of ovarian cancer and identification of molecular targets for novel therapeutic strategies. Her research has been recognized by many awards and elections, most recently being elected to the American Society for Clinical Investigation. She is a dedicated educator and mentor to the residents, fellows, and faculty, and a strong advocate for women's health, women's cancers, and health equity. With that, I would like to hand this over to Dr. Cabelli for her talk today on the perspectives on treatment advances in ovarian cancer. Thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, thank you so much for that introduction, Hima. I'm, I'm really delighted and honored to be here. Um, I've been at WashU since June of 2020, and, um, and it's just a, a fantastic place. Um, it's hard to decide what um, uh, affiliations. We just are in an incredible environment with Washington University, the Siteman Cancer Center, Barnes Jewish Hospital. And so I just put all my affiliations on this one slide. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, the main uh, point of this slide from my perspective is that you can see that I'm very much interested in um, being an advisory board member and supporter of numerous research and advocacy organizations that focus on uh, women's health and gynecologic cancer. So uh, my objectives today are to summarize treatment advances in ovarian cancer focused on the use of 
uh, um, uh, drugs called PARP inhibitors. And I will try to weave in a personal perspective as a gynecologic oncologist and physician scientist. So um, advanced stage epithelial ovarian cancer is associated with poor survival. Uh, what we know is that um, ovarian cancer typically starts in the pelvis and almost immediately spreads along the surfaces of the bowel, the bowel serosa, the pelvic and abdominal peritoneal surfaces. Uh, a favorite place to travel is to the omentum, which is a fat pad that lines the bowel, the surfaces of the liver, the diaphragm. So it's, it's really transcelomic peritoneal exfoliation is the main mode of spread. It also spreads to lymphatics and there's some hematogenous spread, but most of the spread of advanced stage ovarian cancer is within the abdominal cavity. If we are able to diagnose and treat early stage ovarian cancer, such as this patient of mine who was diagnosed with a very large tumor, it looked like she was full term in her pregnancy. We were able to extract the entire tumor without spillage and her survival is 96% essentially with no additional treatment needed. This is in contrast to another patient of mine who presented also looking like she was pregnant. She was in her 60s and her, abdom her abdominal cavity was filled with fluid, liters of fluid, malignant ascites that we drained. And then we performed um, radical tumor debulking where we removed uh, not only her uterus, cervix, fallopian tubes and ovaries, but these tumor nodules that had spread throughout her peritoneum. Despite aggressive surgery followed by um, uh, uh, multimodal chemotherapy, she succumbed to her disease within 18 months of treatment. Um, so the survival rate of stage three disease is approximately 30% of five-year survival and the, the, the survival rate for stage one is 90%. Um, so obviously if we could diagnose and detect ovarian cancer at early stage disease, um, uh, the, the overall outcomes would be so much better. But I'll tell you some of the challenges we have um, with trying to detect ovarian cancer early. First of all, uh, the most common type of ovarian cancer, high-grade serous ovarian cancer, likely arises from the fallopian tube. And so um, in, this, um, in, in this image, we're just showing some of the histological types of ovarian cancer, epithelial ovarian cancer, mucinous invasive ov ovarian cancer on your left. Um, the cells really uh, appear very similar to GI tumors and some of them are concurrent with GI tumors, some of them are metastatic and some of them are primary ovarian tumors that look very similar to uh, GI epithelial tumors. And then we have endometrioid and clear cell cancers um, that are associated with endometriosis, which is a benign uh, non-cancerous condition associated with retrograde menstruation. So endometrioid histology looks like the lining of the uterus. And interestingly, clear cell histology looks very similar to renal cell cancer. So there are probably some developmental origins um, associated with these histological types. High-grade serous under the microscope um, has papillations and papillary fronds that look very similar to the distal end of the fallopian tube. And in fact, there are um, plenty of evidence now to suggest that most of these um, high-grade serous tumors arise from the fallopian tube. And um, the, the fallopian tube origins of ovarian cancer arise from the fact that we people have been able to detect a tubal intraepithelial um, a lesion, a precancer that occurs at the distal end of the fallopian tube. It has a, a essentially what happens is monthly women um, ovulate, where people ovulate, and the ruptured um, follicle, uh, what happens at the surface epithelial of the ovary, there's lots of action with inflammatory mediators. It's a hormonal rich milieu. There's DNA damage at the surface epithelium. And over time, um, uh, this uh, normal fallopian tube epithelium, as depicted here, develops a P53 signature. And as we know, P53 is the guardian of the genome and is a cell cycle uh, 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 protein that's, um, uh, that triggers uh, DNA repair and um, uh, or cell death. But over time, this P53 signature um, 
uh, cells develop into tumor intraepithelial carcinoma and then eventually invasive carcinoma. So you can imagine if you're developing an invasive carcinoma at the surface epithelium, the rest of the fallopian tube is just a tube. So the best place for a cancer to develop is on the surface of the ovary. And since this is a serosal surface that's exposed to the rest of the peritoneal cavity, there's pretty um, uh, immediate, uh, a chance for a pretty immediate spread. Um, so these stick cells, uh, serous tubal intraepithelial carcinomas are able to spread fairly rapidly. So you can imagine that it would be really difficult to detect this precancer at the tip of the fallopian tube with our traditional methods. We talked about the patient who had malignant ascites and, and basically a malignant ascites uh, developed from um, leaky capillaries and, um, and tumor associated um, immune cells like macrophages and, and, and other immune cells and fibroblasts that allow um, damage to the epithelium and then uh, the leak of the fluid into the peritoneal cavity. And this is uh, really a defining feature of um, uh, advanced stage ovarian cancer. And you can see how uh, people, this is a CT image, a sagittal image showing how all of the organs are sort of squished aside uh, because the, um, the, the peritoneal cavity is filled, abdominal cavity is filled with fluid. This is, um, uh, causes a lot of severe symptoms. And uh, obviously we can drain the fluid, but it comes back almost immediately. And so um, a chemotherapeutic um, uh, agents are very helpful um, uh, in combination with draining and obviously getting rid of the primary cancer um, is a treatment for this. Uh, so, so advanced stage ovarian cancer, you can see the dilemma we have. We don't have really good ways to detect it early. If we could, we could definitely improve outcomes. And um, several years ago, the National Academy had a, a committee uh, uh, or um, convened a committee on the state of the science in ovarian cancer. And they looked at biology, research de designs, and um, better interventions, and, um, and also looking at um, other aspects of research, including methods to reduce practice-related disparities in care and supportive care research and practice. And this is important because the continuum uh, goes from pre-vivorship, which is trying to prevent this disease and early detection. And this is important because we know that a certain percentage of ovarian cancers um, uh, upwards to 20% are associated with germline hereditary mutations. And if we can intervene early, then we could prevent um, these cancers in high-risk groups. Um, early detection, there are lots of groups trying to figure out um, other ways to detect uh, these precancers, possibly through blood markers, urine markers, um, uh, to, uh, and, and, you know, this has been a big challenge in the field because we haven't found um, any test that successfully detects this disease early. And then of course, with survivorship, uh, better ways uh, to diagnose and treat it. Um, and I'll talk about the fact that we now have many women who are living longer with ovarian cancer. How do we prevent the this, this second or third recurrence, monitor refer recurrence? And then we have women who have long time survivorship needs and are dealing with side effects, uh, not only from the cancer, but from our treatments. And then not enough attention has been paid to palliative care along the continuum and end of life care. Uh, so these are really multiple um, avenues for ongoing research in our field. Because of advances in research, treatment outcomes have significantly improved. Um, the typical presentation I showed you of advanced stage ovarian cancer is with um, a distended abdomen, um, widespread peritoneal tumor load, and that's associated with symptoms. Uh, we now have a combination of either chemotherapy beforehand uh, followed by surgery or primary surgery, and both methods are followed by platinum-based combination chemotherapy. We know that about 70 to 80 percent of patients will have an excellent response to this treatment. Um, however, uh, the cancer does come back and um, uh, typically it comes back within 12 to 24 months and, um, and it's associated with similar symptoms or a, a suspicious uh, CT findings or an elevated CA125, which is the sort of the only, uh, the main tumor marker that, that's used 
um, to follow disease. It's not that great in, in um, uh, early detection. So uh, what we have available to treat ovarian cancer is aggressive initial treatment. And now we're adding maintenance therapies uh, and the PARP inhibitors are, are where we've really made great strides with maintenance therapy. And um, now women can live five years, six years plus more, even with the diagnosis of advanced stage three and four disease. Um, so, the PARP inhibitors, and we call them PARP inhibitors because otherwise we have to say polyadenosine diphosphate ADP ribose polymerase inhibitors, and that's just too long, uh, cause synthetic lethality in BRCA mutation cancers. And so um, this is just a cartoon of double-stranded DNA, and the top bar here shows different types of DNA damage that can occur, single-strand breaks, double strand breaks, bulky adducts, um, and other types of DNA damage. I want us to focus specifically on double strand breaks. Uh, double strand break DNA damage, um, um, there are two primary pathways for repairing. The most efficient is by homologous recombination. And then the other pathway is non-homologous end joining. And these are the proteins that are involved, um, uh, main proteins involved in homologous recombination repair. Um, I had talked about the fact that there are hereditary um, and germline mutations associated with ovarian cancer. Well, the most common are mutations in genes that encode for BRCA1 and BRCA2. And, um, and the tumor types associated with mut hereditary mutations are not just ovarian cancer, but best breast, pancreatic, and some prostate cancers. And what's interesting is that these tumors, these cancers, are relatively sensitive to uh, DNA damaging drugs, including PARP inhibitors and platinum and platinum-based uh, therapy, platinum salts, which uh, the platinum-based therapy is our primary treatment for ovarian cancer. So the very um, condition that predisposes um, uh, some of these patients to developing cancer uh, are the same uh, conditions that um, confer a better response to treatment. So, um, and then single strand breaks are repaired by base excision repair and um, the primary proteins involved are PARP1, XRCC1 and ligase 3. So if you go over here, if you have a normal cell that's been exposed to some sort of DNA damage, um, um, all of these different DNA repair pathways are activated. And uh, obviously, uh, if, the, if they work correctly, successful repair um, is associated with cell survival. But if there's a failure to repair, then the cells die. So if a, a cell has normal BRCA function, and is, um, has a normal mechanism, for especially the efficient homologous recombination repair, then those cells are more likely to survive. In, in, in cancers that have lost both alleles to BRCA1, for instance, and that um, protein is non-functional, um, that those cells cannot repair by homologous recombination. And if you inhibit repair with a PARP inhibitor that blocks single strand repair, that eventually leads to double strand repair, then you cause synthetic lethality in those cells. And so that's the underlying concept for PARP inhibitors. We now know um, that there are multiple other mechanisms of action. So the main action here is what I just described, single strand break uh, occurs, PARP1 comes in and recruits other proteins to, and through base excision repair, repairs that single strand break. If a single strand break is not repaired, it eventually causes a double strand break. Um, but there are other mechanisms here where um, at a double strand ends and um, uh, where PARP is very important, the PARP protein is important. And, and here is probably the main mechanism by which PARP inhibitors work. It's called PARP trapping. So the PARP, um, uh, the, that these drugs end up trapping PARP um, in these double strand ends or, um, and it becomes um, a mechanism where the, um, uh, the DNA cannot repair, eventually it leads to double strand breaks. So the, the amount of PARP trapping that occurs is actually associated with the potency of the PARP inhibitors themselves.
So the landmark clinical trial that really showed the benefit of PARP inhibitors is called SOLO-1. This was a trial, international trial through our gynecologic oncology group, the GOG. And what um, happened is women were recruited into this trial um, uh, to, uh, after they had completed these are advanced stage, patients with advanced stage cancers were recruited to this trial after they had completed the aggressive chemotherapy and or surgery combinations that I described, and then they were placed on either maintenance PARP, a lap rib as a pill uh, that they would take uh, versus placebo. And uh, what you see here is quite remarkable. I call them the alligator jaws. You, you rarely see um, a progression-free survival Kaplan-Meier curves this stark. So the hazard ratio is 0 0.28. So there's almost a 70% um, uh, decrease in recurrence for or platinum or improvement in platinum free survival for patients who were treated with a lap rib compared to those um, on the maintenance. Um, the other important point about this trial is for entry into the trial, the patients had to have a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation, either uh, germline status or somatic within the tumor itself. And so the bottom line of this landmark trial is that elaborate maintenance reduced disease progression by greater than 70%. So PARP inhibitors over the past couple of years have significantly shifted um, our treatment paradigm. And uh, this was a uh, um, European um, a meeting of a medical oncologist, um, scientific um, ESMO meeting in September 2019. And it was all about PARPs. Uh, PARP inhibitors uh, take center stage, uh, nirapirib, a potent PARP when, when newly diagnosed ovarian cancer, the VILIA trial, the PALVA trial. And so um, at this point, we have three PARP inhibitors that are FDA approved for the treatment of ovarian cancer and um, several others that are undergoing trial. I'm excited to, to talk about um, some of the, um, the uh, one of the, the trials that was, that just came out in Nature Communications yesterday, group from University of Washington, Liz Swisher, who's a good friend of mine, and may be difficult to see this slide, but the bottom line is that the improvement in survival really depends on, and sensitivity to the PARP inhibitors depends on maintaining the uh, BRCA um, deficient status or the homologous recombination deficient status. And so uh, the, the improvement really is associated the this and the sensitivity to the PARP inhibitor is, is uh, you know, strongly correlated with um, the, the loss of heterozygosity or BRCA um, uh, mutant status. And then um, in addition, if when they looked at um, tumors that had high BRCA1 methylation, so if essentially a gene is normal, but it's methylated, so its function is suppressed, those, um, those uh, tumors behave in a similar fashion to, to the tumors that have BRCA mutations. In addition, um, the presence of a RAD51C or D mutation, and that's another one of those proteins that's in that homologous recombination pathway, those patients, um, if those tumors had any of those features, um, progression-free, the probability of progression-free survival was significantly improved. So I, I hope I've shown you up to this point that we are moving towards in some sort of way, trying to personalize and target treatment for ovarian cancer. I described our initial treatment as pretty generic. In general, if you're diagnosed with um, you know, epithelial ovarian cancer and uh, you're gonna undergo a combination of surgery and cytotoxic platinum-based chemotherapy, um, you know, under the microscope, um, the histology looks very similar. So we're understanding that it's really important to, to, to perform additional testing to kind of distinguish the molecular features of these tumors at, at minimum to help us with prognosis. And now with the PARP inhibitors um, in, in informing, better informing treatment. So we're trying to move towards biomarker targeted therapy. As I described with the origins, fallopian tube origins of high-grade serous ovarian cancer, 96 to 100% of these uh, tumors 
um, are mutated in, in P53. So that's the dominant mutation. But unlike other cancers like lung cancer, where you have a combination of EGFR mutations or other mutations, really the dominant features beyond P53 are whether there's a homologous recombination deficient or BRCA mutant-like feature or a homologous recombination proficient able to repair DNA damage and a non-BRCA-like uh, underlying molecular feature. And um, so we know that this BRCA-like uh, uh, molecular phenotype um, uh, and genotype uh, uh, predisposes to sensitivity to platinum-based chemotherapy and PARP inhibitors. And so, um, uh, and because I am very, very stubborn, I started to ask questions about what about this group of patients and, and, and um, how can we do better for, for treating those types of tumors? So we have um, spent um, some portion of my lab, spent some time um, mining the Cancer Genome Atlas, the TCGA. And this is um, a public database that allows us to um, look at features of high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And other people have published this, but we were looking at other um, other molecular alterations that could be associated with, with poor survival. Um, it has been published before by our group and others that CCNE1, which is the gene that encodes for cyclin E, another cell cycle protein, um, is associated with poor survival and poor prognosis. Um, and what when we look at the TCGA, we can see that a, over 50% of tumors in the TCGA have features of a homologous recombination deficiency. So they're BRCA mutant-like. But the other 50% have other features and a significant number of them either have CCNE1 amplifications or a combination of CCNE1 and BRD4, which is an epigenetic protein, bromodomain, extra terminal uh, protein that's associated with epigenetic regulation of uh, trans gene transcription. And we found that there was an overlap uh, with some of our CCNE1 amplified tumors and BRD4 amplified tumors. And let me just pause for a second and, and go back to a point I was trying to make earlier. Um, High-grade serous ovarian cancer, other than the P53 mutations and some mutations associated with the homologous recombination pathway, um, really is, um, is characterized by a whole swaths of the genome that either amplified or lost. So um, amplification so the gene itself, um, the, the sequence is normal, but there's too many copies of it. It's amplified. And so that's what we're talking about here, that, that there's not a mutation in CCNE1 or BRD4, but there are just too many copies. Um, and so uh, when we looked, there was a, a correlation on our, we, we then went and looked at our own tissue. We took this data from TCGA and then looked at a tissue microarray that I had created many years ago at Vanderbilt, where we stain tumors for protein expression of cyclin E and BRD4. And we saw that there was a correlation between uh, proteins that had high expression of cyclin E and BRD4. And, um, and then the, these are individual patient samples. And then um, those that had low expression, there's a correlation with those that had low expression of both proteins. When we looked at cyclin E expression, so this is protein expression and platinum sensitivity, we found that those tumors that had high expression of cyclin E were more likely to be resistant to, to platinum. And then we went back to the TCGA and looked at amplification and survival. And what was interesting is that in those tumors that had both, um, that were in this group that had amplifications in both cyclin E, CCNE1 and BRD4, uh, uh, those, those patients had worst survival. So um, this, this really tells us that there's a group of um, tumors that are almost the complete opposite of those tumors that have BRCA mutations and that they're less likely to um, respond to our traditional treatment. Well, I'm gonna back up a little bit because um, um, I, I started research 
uh, many years ago um, at Einstein, uh, when I was a G1 oncology fellow, it was part of our it was part of our requirement as as our clinical fellowship to spend a year doing research. And I ended up in a lab, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But as a as a postdoc, um, I, I fell in love with research and ended up doing a postdoctoral fellowship. And I was in a uh, colon cancer lab, and they were studying. Um, histone deacetylases uh, inhibitors and um, butyrate is a short chain fat, fatty acid that resides in the gut and it's our natural histone deacetylase inhibitor. And they spent a lot of time studying butyrate and, and other histone deacetylase inhibitors in this particular lab. This was Len Augenlich's lab at Einstein. And uh, one of the, the faculty down the hall, it was a huge, huge program, multiple labs were under this umbrella, asked me one day, John Mary Dawson, who's now in Australia, he said, Dineo, have you ever tried this on your ovarian cancer cells? I bet it would work. <laughs> so I took some butyrate and uh, you can, the, the dose, the concentrations are very high, millimolar amounts, but we were able to inhibit um, cell proliferation by treating ovarian cancer cells with butyrate. Over time, I started looking at other histone deacetylase inhibitors. Saha is, is now um, called Varinostat and FK228 is Romadepsin. And this is more potent in nanomolar concentrations. And so I, I developed an interest in, in looking to see if we could um, inhibit cell proliferation with um, uh, HDAC inhibitors. And it, it was important for me to look at these types of drugs to see if we could add them to our traditional therapy to overcome this problem of chemotherapy resistance. So FK228 aromadepsin was very potent in inhibiting cell proliferation, clonogenic assays, it inhibited um, uh, cell growth. Uh, we know that it hit the target because we could see acetylation of H4 and P21, another checkpoint protein was activated by the HDAC inhibition. And this occurred um, uh, uh, with increasing doses and over time. We then looked at the expression of um, HDAC proteins in our normal um, epithelial ovarian cells and ovarian cancer cells. And it appeared that the HDACs were uh, more highly expressed in our tumors rather than normal cells. And, um, and the normal cells did not respond very well to increasing doses of HDAC inhibition, whereas the cancer cells did. And then we performed siRNA knockdown experiments to see if targeting or knocking down HDAC 1, 2, 3 uh, in the different classes of HDACs would make a difference. And um, knocking down class two, um, 2 HDACs did not the class one HDACs, we, which we focused on, if we knocked down class one, two, or three alone or in combination, we were able to inhibit cell proliferation in ovarian cancer cells. So this was very exciting to me, and I started working on HDACs. So I'll back up a second. Um, this is important because um, if you're thinking about how I describe that ovarian cancer cells are a problem of gene, um, too many copies of a gene. Uh, perhaps if you could um, alter gene regulation, you could make a difference in the expression of those genes. And that's why I became very interested in epigenetic modifiers. Um, so if you look here, um, the histone core is shown in orange and histone tails are in blue and DNA wrapped around is in black. And, and we call them histone deacetylase uh, uh, inhibitors, but they're actually um, lysine, the K, the lysine tails, they're KDAX actually, technically speaking. But, um, and traditionally we thought that um, HDACs are associated with repression of um, gene expression and that HATS or histone acetylases are associated with gene activation. We've now come to understand that the HDAC inhibitors can um, also um, activate a certain uh, group of genes and act like HATS, but have the opposite um, effect on, um, on gene repression. Um, and it just depends on the cell type and cell context. So um, epigenetic modifiers include writers, readers um, of the genome, 
And um, this is a very exciting area. Um, we have talked about BRCA1 methylation. So, um, you know, targeting that is another um, kind of uh, strategy for, um, for, for inhibiting these, these um, proteins. So um, epigenetic drugs, there's a long history of their use in cancers. Um, uh, as single agents, they're very effective in um, hematologic malignancies and are approved, especially for anastat and romadepsin for certain types of lymphomas and leukemia T cell um, cutaneous lymphoma. Um, uh, over here in the table is just the epigenetic mechanism. Here are our writers, our readers, and our erasers. And in blue are the different types of proteins I'm interested in studying and uh, the different types of drugs that we study in my lab. And what we found in solid tumors is that the, uh, these drugs really are not effective as single agents. Um, they have to be used in combination with other drugs. And um, uh, uh, partly it's because of pharmacodynamics and penetration of these drugs into solid tumors and, and there are other mechanisms that we're, we're studying. But I've spent um, a lot of time looking at these um, drugs and I still, I still believe that there's um, some place for them in, in treating uh, solid tumors, including ovarian cancer. So in order to continue along this path, I've developed a bi-directional translational research approach. because so I'm really interested in looking at novel epigenetic drug combinations specifically to treat chemotherapy resistant ovarian cancer. And we're hoping to discover um, diagnostic, prognostic, and or predictive markers of response and, and hopefully from these therapeutic combinations. Um, we um, do, standard molecular biology in our lab. Um, we perform cell culture with a variety of ovarian cancer cell lines that are well characterized. We treat with standard platinum or PARP inhibitor therapy combined with these drugs. We perform cell viability and growth assays, Western blots, immunofluorescence for known targets, immunohistochemistry, um, and, uh, and genomics, which I will not show today. But I will show my favorite assay. My favorite assay is an immunofluorescence assay for detection of double strand breaks. It um, looks at phosphorylation of gamma H2AX. And uh, essentially what happens is that uh, proteins at, the, at uh, the site of uh, DNA damage in a double strand break, it, including uh, there's early activation of a series, a cascade of events recruiting multiple proteins into the area to help, help um, uh, repair that damage. And ga gamma H2AX phosphorylation is one of those early signals. And it, you can see a couple of nuclei here and the green fluorescence is an immunofluorescent um, a, a tag for um, the expression of gamma H2AX after these cells. These are human peripheral blood nuclear, mononuclear cells that were exposed to radiation, ionizing radiation. Um, if DNA is not repaired, so the signal stays on until more proteins are recruited in, and it will stay on um, until the cell dies. So if, if the DNA is not repaired, these signals stay on and uh, you get more expression. And finally, you get pan-nuclear expression that is uh, sometimes a signal um, uh, that's associated with apoptosis. So um, I had an opportunity in sort of when I was switching, um, when I had been recruited to Vanderbilt, um, I had spent about four years at Meharry Medical College after I completed my, my um, postdoctoral training at Einstein and three years on the faculty, I was recruited to uh, Meharry Medical College. And I was there for four years and then recruited to Vanderbilt. And that summer in between, I had a visiting uh, professorship at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard and uh, stayed in graduate school housing on MIT's campus for that summer, which was really interesting, and was able to make use of Broad tool compounds. This is chemical biology, uh, um, uh, and they had medicinal chemists in this huge shop where they would make their own compounds in Stuart Schreiber's lab. And so I had access to these compounds and I used my favorite assay 
to evaluate HDAC inhibitors and to see which of those would induce DNA damage marked by gamma H2AX phosphorylation. And so we would it, we could count, um, this is um, DAPI stain nuclei, gamma H2AX with the, the fluorescence, green fluorescent dye. And, um, and so we set a cutoff of greater than five was probably associated with DNA damage. And we were able to screen these compounds. So the control, um, uh, there's no treatment. Saha was our positive control. We knew it caused it. BRD5051, the broad, that broad compound did nothing. And BRD7914 did something. And we actually were able to uh, perform more experiments on this particular compound and show that it caused apoptosis. And I was just so excited. I was like, we, we have this new compound we can start studying. Well, it turns out this tool compound was actually an, an, a compound very similar to a Merck compound, and Merck was absolutely not interested in continuing to uh, pursue any kind of uh, investigation with this particular drug. So this is where this that particular story ended, but it didn't stop my interest in looking at HDAC inhibitor combinations. And so we used these drugs to, um, in combinations with um, different types of HDAC inhibitors and in combinations with platinum or PARP inhibitors and have really discovered preclinical evidence for their use. And um, so this, this data, these data here, um, um, we're looking at panobinostat, another pretty potent um, um, HDAC inhibitor at nanomolar concentrations, was able to um, uh, inhibit the expression of not only cyclin E that I talked about earlier, that cell cycle protein associated with proliferation, but inhibit BRCA1 and, and all three of our HDAC inhibitors were able to do this. E2F1 is a protein involved in transcription of both BRCA1 and cyclin E and that was reduced um, with treatment with the HDAC inhibitors. Um, apoptosis was significantly increased. Cleaved PARP is a marker of apoptosis. And we knew we were hitting our target with HDAC inhibitor because we're acetylating H3. When we combined panobinostat, which was the most potent here, with um, alaparib, um, uh, alaparib, which is the PARP inhibitor alone, really did not do much to cyclin E, BRCA1, or E2F1. But when we combined panobinostat with alaparib, we were able to um, nearly eliminate expression of cyclic E, BRCA1, and E2F1. And um, th this interesting observation is what we spent, we're spending a lot of time looking at on the transcriptional level. And this is, this particular story is what we're looking at for some of our genomics work. And I will not talk about that today. But we were able to show that the combination of panobinostat and alaparib was synergistic. Um, across multiple cell lines, including cell lines that had BRCA um, that were absent with, with a BRCA1. Um, we were also able to show that panobinostat reduces homologous recombination DNA repair function. So not only is gene transcription and protein transcription downregulated, um, the ability to repair by homologous recombination is downregulated. So we have a couple of immunofluorescent assays that we use to assess this. Um, there's a RAD51 uh, protein expression ratio to gamma H2AX protein expression ratio, and we can see the panobinostat reduces um, uh, expression of those proteins. And then this is a DRGFP plasmid assay that's well known to assess homologous recombination repair of a double strand break. And so if GFP is present, that means that the, the repair was was that that HR repair occurred. And uh, if there's less GFP, that means that, that HR was deficient. And so the panobinostat reduced um, uh, in uh, the HR repair, and it was really driven by the, the HDAC inhibitor. We went on to show um, that uh, the combination increased um, cleaved PARP, um, and caspase-3, which are cleaved caspase-3 markers of um, apoptosis and phosphorylation of gamma H2AX by Western blot. So a variety of methods to show that um, we were um, reducing these proteins that were clearly involved in not only HR repair, but apoptosis or cell death. 
And then in order to perform um, pharmacodynamic experiments where we could extract tumors and perform Western blots, we performed subcutaneous um, uh, injection of ovarian cancer cells and, um, and then um, looked at uh, tumor volume um, and tumor growth. And you can see this is the control. This is a lab rib, panabinista, and the combination. Um, uh, significantly reduced um, tumor volume and, and tumor size. And then we were able to show in the tumors themselves that with the combination, we saw a decrease in expression of cyclone and BRCA1, increase in cleaved PARP, which is the apoptosis marker, a decrease in PCNA, which is a marker of proliferation, and an increase in phosphorylation of gamma H2AX. So these results led us, um, a combination of the previous publications and these results led us to go to AstraZeneca to see if they would be interested in launching a, a clinical trial because all of these drugs were already being used clinically for other purposes. Well, this took several years because the company um, uh, had no interest in pursuing panabinostat. And in fact, there were some early signals that panabinostat, which is a pan HDAC inhibitor, had too much toxicity whereas antinostat is an HDAC class one, HDAC one, two selective inhibitor. And we were finally able to get it together between AstraZeneca and Syndax that makes antinostat to proceed with a phase one, two trial of a lab rib with antinostat for recurrent platinum resistant homologous recombination repair proficient ovarian cancers. So the PI is my partner, my former partner, Marta Crispins at Vanderbilt. Um, I, we started this trial when I was at uh, KU, but the translational component has followed us to WashU. We have um, four, four patients on trial now, and we're trying to get the trial open here at WashU. Well, I showed you all that data, but we'd never tested Intinistat in our own hands in our lab. So as the trial started, we quickly went back to look at the effects of a lap ribbon and Tinistat in our hands in our lab. And we had um, commercial cell lines, but also patient-derived xenograft cell lines or patient-derived cell lines that we'd established at University of Kansas and showed that in, in most of the cell lines, um, the combination of drugs was synergistic, and this is by a combination index. And in one of our cell lines, we showed clonogenic assay um, uh, with a combination reduced um, uh, with synergistic and reducing uh, clonogenic growth. Um, an intraperitoneal model of ovarian cancer with BLI using SCOV3 um, IP cells showed that we were able to reduce peritoneal spread. And then we had also developed a um, patient-derived xenograft model. This particular model, or several models, but in this particular model was HR proficient and was cyclone e amplified. And this um, model we established at University of Kansas developed bloody ascites that we familiar to us who treat women with ovarian cancer and peritoneal spread. And the protein markers were consistent with high-grade serous and looked identical to the patients. And so when we provide, formed a survival analysis of, these, of this model, we found that the combination improved survival significantly compared to control. So we also wanted to find out if the combination causes DNA damage. And so we performed comet assays where we measured the tail, the nuclear tail, to see if there was um, an increase in actual DNA damage and not just the signal. And then here is our gamma H2AX assay. Um, instead of green, it's red fluorescent dye showing that, um, that we have developed increased uh, DNA damage with a combination of drugs. And that BRCA1 protein expression was reduced significantly with the combination um, by protein expression and by um, PCR for a, a BRCA mRNA expression. And that CHI-67 protein expression was significantly reduced with the combination and cleaved PARP, which is a marker of apoptosis, was increased. Um, so then I arrived at WashU, I said, in June, and we were able to quickly establish new collaborations. And this is a collaboration with the Vindigni lab um, that, that um, uh, speaks to a potential mechanism of action. So the combination of drugs, which is really driven probably most by antinostat, causes a stalling of replication fork progression. And if replication fork progression is stalled, that increases the chance for more PARP trapping and DNA double strand breaks, 
And so that is a potential mechanism for improving um, the um, efficacy of Olaparib in these cells. So to conclude, we, we summarize that Olaparib inhibits PARP1 that repairs single strand breaks. If you inhibit single strand breaks, uh, then you cause double strand breaks. Um, PARP also, uh, PARP trapping is also induced by Olaparib. If we treat with HDAC inhibitor and tinostat, um, that causes different um, uh, a down regulation of homologous recombination gene expression, such as BRCA1, but also stalls and inhibits replication fork progression, which leads to more double strand breaks. And you're not able to repair the double strand breaks and that leads to cell death. So I hope I've summarized that uh, PARP inhibitors are promising drugs, clear advantage in homologous recombination deficient BRCA mutated cancers because I'm stubborn, I'm interested in the homologous recombination proficient non-BRCA mutated ovarian cancer. And we have a clinical trial and preclinical evidence to suggest that this uh, drug combination could help. And we've developed multiple preclinical models and we're going to be continuing with bi-directional approaches to study these epigenetic and genetic targets. Um, and so um, other mechanisms include the effects of these drugs on the tumor microenvironment. And I talked about the fact that we're looking really at using some genomic strategies to look at what's happening at the transcriptional level. So I wanted to take just a second um, to just talk about my professional history and um, that, uh, you know, and sort of highlight some of what's influenced my, my trajectory. Um, before WashU, I was the division chief of gynecologic oncology at University of Kansas, and I started their first ACGME accredited gynoc fellowship and a multidisciplinary hereditary clinic, because as you can see, I'm very interested in BRCA1 and BRCA2 and the implications for patients, and we launched the clinical trial. At Vanderbilt, we started a group called the Vanderbilt Ovarian Cancer Alliance, and that group still meets monthly um, on the third Wednesday every month, and that's a multidisciplinary group of researchers who've come together to focus on ovarian cancer. Um, I created tissue bank and tissue microarrays that we still use today. That summer at the Broad Institute launched several summers there. They were part of my K08, and uh, Stuart Schreiber is, has just always been a person who's been very welcoming to me, even though I do nothing similar to what he does, and um, provided us with broad compounds and just advice about studying these drugs. When I was at Meharry Medical College, I was I was recruited there. Um, uh, as you know, it's one of the four black, uh, historically black medical schools in the country. And they had lost their residency and I was part of a recruitment of faculty to regain their residency program. And I stayed from their internship year to graduating them. They all passed their boards and I still maintain very close ties with Meharry. They still have their residency. I also launched the, launched the Women's Cancer Research Lab and that lab is still going today. But why did I start on this research track? Well, at Einstein in 1998, uh, when I was in the um, lab, um, I was in Raju Kuchula Party's lab and they, his lab was part of the Human Genome Project. And they were creating early cDNA microarrays. And on my uh, mentorship committee was uh, Susan Horowitz who uh, discovered the mechanisms of Taxol, one of the drugs we use to treat ovarian cancer. So, so that exposure really launched me on a research career. I trained at Cornell, while Cornell New York Hospital at a time when um, right after the Libby Zion case, which changed resident duty hours. And so that's really impacted my um, view of residency training. And one of the reasons I went into medicine is as an undergrad and medical student in New York City, it was the height, height of the AIDS epidemic. And I think about people um, I took care of who died alone in Roosevelt Hospital uh, in Midtown, that hospital doesn't exist anymore. And I, I just think about what, we're what we've gone through and what we're going through today with the COVID epidemic and pandemic. And another big influence is the Black Women's Health Project. Career development programs, my family influenced me. I use this little cartoon that, to remind me that there are plenty of supporters and mentors. I wish there were more. There are plenty of haters and tormentors, and sometimes I thank them for motivating me. But what I, I really get disappointed in many times is a silent bystanders who could do so much more to help people along their trajectory. This is my um, uh, 
professional identity. And I'd like to thank all my collaborators, the funders, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Cabelli, for that excellent talk. I know I learned a lot that I'll definitely be able to use in the future. Um, we do have one question that came in the chat. Um, thank you for your talk, Dr. Cabelli. What do we know about how a free floating fallopian tube cell changes into something that can invade and settle into tissue? And do we think that HDAC tar targeting therapies early on, if we catch it, will be able to help prevent disease progression? That's an interesting question, a very good question. Um, the, there are certain types of uh, fallopian tube cells. There's secretory and ciliary cells that, are, that are, exist in the fallopian tube, and it, it looks like the secretory one, are, are the ones that are most important. Um, and we know that there are early changes that occur. We also know that we do have preventive therapy for ovarian cancer in the, in the use of oral contraceptives and progesterone IUD. And so we know that inhibiting, um, probably inhibiting progesterone is the main effect, but there's something that's going on there. So yes, so if we could combine um, an HDAC inhibitor at very low doses with a, a birth control pill, um, that could be something very interesting. Now we have to be concerned about toxicity of every drug or any drug that we give people. But I think that that's something interesting as well. Um, we know that um, anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin could have play a role in, in prevention as well. We just don't know, uh, really clearly understand the mechanisms as much as we would like. So, Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then another question that I had as well um, as one of the audience members is, um, is there a theoretic role in the future for CAR-T in ovarian cancer? Yeah, so, so there's lots, I mean, we just had our national meeting, um, our, our Society of Gynecologic Oncology, and, and, and I, I must say that immunotherapy treatments for ovarian cancer have been disappointing, and we're all trying to figure out how to make them better, uh, because theoretically you target the, the, the immune microenvironment, and that should help. Um, there are several um, uh, places around the country where they are using uh, different types of CAR-T therapy um, or CAR-T th therapy-like for um, uh, strategies for ovarian cancer. It's not just about T-cells. Um, you know, our, our group looks at targeting macrophages and reprogramming them. Other people are looking at dendritic cells. It's such a complex story and somehow it's not working as well as we would like, and we don't quite know, but there are plenty of clinical trials around the country using CAR-T therapy for treatment of ovarian cancer. Um, and another question, um, what would you ask slash what is the optimized role of the PCP for a patient actively undergoing treatment for ovarian cancer? Well, I, I work very closely with our primary care doctors um, uh, and primary care physicians and providers, nurse practitioners, because this type of treatment is, at least the initial treatment, is really tough. Um, most of the patients we see are in their 60s. They have other medical conditions. And so what we're asking them to do is to undergo radical surgery and really pretty intense chemotherapy. And so the way that I work very closely with PCPs is, first of all, we need to optimize the underlying medical conditions to make sure that the patient is fit for surgery. Oftentimes we, we have, we can maybe, if somebody's too weak to undergo primary surgery, or if the tumor is too widespread, we will treat with chemotherapy first for a number of cycles. And that's a perfect time to kind of optimize, maybe do some prehab, um, uh, you know, optimize blood pressure, um, glucose management, and then um, preparing for surgery, and then really working in partnership to make sure that we're not causing additional side effects from polypharmacy, <laughs> from the chemotherapy drugs and the, the um, supplemental drugs, anti-nausea drugs, et cetera, that we give with chemotherapy along with whatever the patient's taking. I also would say that I, I when I do talks in the community and go and speak to people in the community, you know, and, and why I'm so um, supportive of advocacy organizations is because women are telling us their symptoms and we're not listening. So I've had several patients actually recently um, had a patient we diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer. Her symptoms were bloating, 
an inability to eat, unexplained weight loss. I mean, these are typical symptoms and somehow it, it, she, and you can read through, she's, she's reporting these symptoms. So if somebody has these symptoms, you know, over weeks to months, they need a workup and it's okay to send them to GI, but send them in parallel to a gynecologist. Um, uh, because, um, we, we are, we end up, um, you know, I told you these types of cancer spread almost immediately, but in some of them, uh, we see that there's a delay in diagnosis because people are, are just, women are just not getting to the right doctor. So. Would, and kind of as a follow-up to that, would, if you have like someone coming in with bloating and whatnot, um, would the first step be getting like a pelvic ultrasound um, in order before, as you're doing like that gyne referral? Yeah. So if somebody just has localized symptoms um, and, you know, abnormal bleeding, um, you know, they're feeling some lower abdominal pelvic discomfort, it's very reasonable to obtain um, a, a pelvic ultrasound to see and send them to a gynecologist. If somebody's you know, like the patient that I show that has a distended abdomen, you know, on it, we still do exams, right? Touch the patient. You can feel some people can feel masses. You can do a fluid wave. You can detect ascites. That type of patient needs a CT scan. Um, and then there, you know, for diagnostic purposes, a CA-125, if you suspect that this is metastatic cancer, then a CA-125 is helpful, but it's not helpful in, in somebody who doesn't have symptoms and is just going for a routine um, visit or just has a, a vague symptom. Absolutely. I think we're right at about time. So thank you so much, Dr. Cabelli, for spending your morning with us. Oh, really you're welcome. You I'm so excited to have done this. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All I'm right. going to go ahead and share my screen um, for the QR codes. Um, thank you again. Thank you. Bye.